The story starts with Akane Nishino waking up, and it seems she overslept. She wakes up days from a pretty horrible dream and takes a shower. She gets ready and opens the door, but upon opening it, she has another flashback of some paparazzi taking shots of her, and nearly has a breakdown until her driver shouts out her name and asks if she's all okay. She gets herself together, and the driver takes her to school. When Nishino arrives, all the other students look at her in awe and want to be friends, as she is the perfect schoolgirl. She is beautiful, intelligent, and a former actress and idol, so everyone looks up to her and treats her like a celebrity. When all the other students greet her, she gets closer to the lockers and spots the only person she despises. His name is Minoru Kagino, and he is our main protagonist. He has a pretty mediocre personality, and he's the only one who doesn't care about Nishino and always seems to forget her name. But she hopes that one day he will remember it just like the rest of the world. She always tries to make an effort with him to see if his perspective will change one day. As she approaches him this time, she greets him, and he greets her back. But he calls her Nishimura, making Nishino freeze on the spot with a sarcastic, happy face and furious with his response. Not only does she get upset about him getting the name wrong, but the most frustrating part is that, unlike everybody else, when Nishino is in his presence, he almost acts like there's nobody even there. This annoys her as this experience is so different from what she's usually used to. Even when they lock eyes, it never feels right. It is almost as if Kajina was looking directly past her, and that is when her hatred toward him was complete. After correcting her name to him for the 100th time, he responds by mumbling under his breath, calling her an NPC. She gets confused and asks him what he means by NPC, and afterward, Kajina apologizes, saying that he creates his main characters inside his head along with others, which he labels as NPCs, which are unimportant people in his life, and that she happens to be an NPC to him. Nishinob doesn't know what to say back to this, but he tries correcting her name again, but he says it in another funny way, which is still completely wrong, still. So after that, they go to class. The other students were fascinated by Nishino when they were in class and asked her many questions about getting back into showbiz. She is set to return to her acting career very soon. Next Monday night, airing in a top-rated show, she explains to us how, after a recent scandal in middle school, she had to quit acting for some time after all the hate towards her, and ever since that day, she's had to hide behind a mask, hiding away until it was all resolved. Finally, during high school, she is back to being herself again. Nishino always plays the part of being the teacher's pet to be the class's favorite and the popular girl so everyone will like her and have zero enemies just to make up for what happened back then. She also sticks around after classes to help the teacher with some prep work for the next day and stays there pretty late too. But after school, her driver had been beaten up by some thug so she began to walk home alone instead, as he was nowhere to be seen. On her way home, the same thugs that took out the driver had been following her, and this is where they take her for ransom, adding that her father will need to pay a considerable fee for her release. While being taken by the thugs, she can see someone watching in the distance, but she doesn't know who this is as it's too dark, and she doesn't get a good enough look before they cover up her face, but they nine shows the audience that the mysterious figure is Kajeno. After waking up in the warehouse, Nishina was scared as they discuss what they will do to her if her father doesn't pay the money. Kajina is waiting outside and uses a mirror to see the reflection of what's happening inside the warehouse. After analyzing the building, he changes into his secret identity before entering. The thugs note that this is her second time being taken, and the first was some obsessive stalker. But this time, it will be her father's enemies, and one of them wants to have some fun with her. But just before he acts, Kajino breaks the glass of the roof and reveals himself as a stylish rough man slayer. One of the guys thinks it's some joke and pulls out his gun, but Kajino knocks it out of his hand within a split millisecond, shocking them all. After Kajino mocks the thug, saying he has no movement skills, he finishes him off extremely fast. The other man notices how Kajino isn't an ordinary fighter and adds that he's also an ex-military man, so he's been waiting for such a challenge for a long time. He pulls out a knife and tries attacking Kajino, getting a few hits on him. However, it's nothing that Kajino isn't used to. Right after he pulls out his favorite weapon, a crowbar, he warns the man that crowbars might be the best street weapon, as they're light, sturdy, and incredibly versatile, and something he can use as nunchucks, and they also have the end of something like a golf club, not to mention the sharp blades at the end. The big guy has more overall body power and tries to crush Kajino, but while fighting, Kajino warns him that he is also the man named the Balaclava Berserker. As someone has been fighting all the biker gangs and their signature weapon is the crowbar, the man realizes he is the Balaclava Berserker and acknowledges that this guy made all the bikers start wearing helmets. Kajino proceeds and breaks the guy's legs and beats him up, freeing Akan Nishino, but right after he set her free, he disappeared in an instant. After a few hours, Nishino's father arrives, and using his connections, he manages to hide this incident from going public, so Nishino was able to continue her acting career without any problems. However, her biggest regret was not finding out the true identity of the stylish ruffian slayer. The next day at school,
school, Nishino arrives and once again, she greets Kageno, hoping he will remember her name. And this time, he calls her by her actual name, shocking Nishino. This time, Kageno locks directly into her eyes, but it felt right this time like she was actually there. And she realizes that Kageno is a lot like herself, hiding behind a mask. Well, that's what she concludes. However, she can't even ask him anymore. The following day, Kajina was on the news. Kajina was found dead near the city road as he was hit by a truck gun and didn't survive. After that, Kajina was taken to an alternate world where he explains a bit about himself. He describes how, like most boys, they want to be a hero when they're younger. But Kajino was actually serious about this path in life. He would stop at nothing until he was the strongest being known in the universe. At school, he is known as a mediocre, harmless, and inconspicuous background character. But behind the mask, he was an incredible fighter and gave everything to his training. But it simply wasn't enough. Kafana's thoughts of being this hero get even more profound as he gets upset about being just an ordinary human, as humans are just way too weak, unable to fight off a group of military soldiers if it ever came to that. And no matter how strong a person might be, such as a mixed martial arts master or even a boxing world champion, you're still labeled as human. So if a nuclear explosion erupted, they would all cease to exist, evaporating into dust. But Kajino can't afford that to be his life and wants nothing more than to be the one, the one who can't be stopped, the one who they will call the eminent shadow. He was a very powerful being with many powerful girls in his entourage, but the only possible way of becoming this hero is by being reincarnated into this other world, which is what happened to him after the truck incident. He tells us how he's just been blessed with a new life and born with these incredible powers, something nobody has ever quite seen before, and he will only use them to gain more power, giving off authentic anti-hero vibes. He's now known as Sid Kajino and has a secret underground clan called the Shadows. But before we see how Kajino got to this lord status level in this magical world, we're taken back to a brief flashback after that fateful day of Truck Kun. Kajino, now known as Sidi, woke up as the son of Baron and Lady Kagenu, aristocrats living out in the kingdom of Midgar. The Kajinu bloodline is known for producing dark knights or fencers who can enhance their abilities with magic. For this reason, his parents have high expectations for their children, particularly Claire Kaganu, Sid's elder sister. With her exceptional talent, he grew up in his sister's shadows. Unbeknownst to his family, he has another business to deal with at night, hunting down bandits. After dominating the battle using his slime sword and bodysuit, Sid takes possession of the stolen treasures. Not long after the messy confrontation, he finds a strange creature trapped inside a cage. As it piques his interest, Sid takes it home for some experimentation. After a month of trial and error, his efforts eventually bear fruit and the hideous looking creature transforms into its true nature as a beautiful elven girl. Before she can see Sid, he immediately acts to look cool, claiming that he broke a curse cast on her and the hero's descendants. He takes out a fiction book about a demon named Diablos. Continuing his fabricated story, Three mysterious heroes defeated Diablos, but he cursed them before he succumbed to his death. Sid also tells her that the cult of Diablos is plotting something to revive their boss, the demon behind her suffering. Introducing himself as a shadow, he asks the girl to join him in his mission to subjugate the cult. Although he just made it all up, she agrees to join Sid's organization, the Shadow Garden. From then on, the girl became his second in command and earned the moniker Alpha. Three years pass, and Sid, now 13 years old, is spotted spurring with Claire. Although he could have easily defeated defeated her, he decided to keep it low-key. Hence, Claire sends him flying into midair. As it turns out, when nobles reach 15, they must attend the Midgar Royal Spells Rit Academy for Dark Knights. However, when the day of Claire's departure arrives, she's nowhere to be found. With her room in shambles, the following scene shows another elven girl named Beta, the first additional member recruited by Alpha. She's just one of the many members added to the organization as we see Alpha and the others finding leads about Claire's whereabouts. Interestingly enough, Sid's subordinates figure out that the cult of Diablo is behind Claire's disappearance. Unaware that his made-up story has come to life, Sid fancies his members to win acting rewards for being so immersed in their roles. Beta believes Claire was targeted because the culprit suspected her to be one of the hero's descendants. She lays out the map of the enemy's hideouts but still determines where they keep Claire. Taking out a slime knife, Sid throws it at the map, revealing his sister's location. Without further ado, he commands Beta to gather the Shadow Garden's elite members, better known as the Seven Shadows. Meanwhile, the Count Grease, a high-ranking officer from the cult of Diablos is seen taunting Claire. Having been restrained with magic sealing chains, Claire could only dodge his attack. While Grease credits Baron Kajinu for her improvement in fights, Claire clarifies that training with Sid helped her. When Grease expresses his interest in her brother, she lashes out at him, paying no heed to her 
her injured hands. As Claire threatens Grease should he lay a finger on her brother, the latter knocks her out cold. Suddenly, one of Grease's men alerts him about some intruders. To his horror, all his underlings fall prey to the sudden shadows. Enraged, Grease charges at Alpha, but he's no match for her. As she draws the first blood out of options, he takes a red pill, instantly boosting his power. Grease manages to shove Alpha away, but since he's still outnumbered, he runs off. When he thinks he will make it out alive, he runs into Sid, who effortlessly blocks his attack. Our MC gives Grease a lecture about how to wield the sword properly until he's had enough of the playtime. Hence, Grease kicks the bucket, and Sid takes his locket necklace with a picture of him and his daughter. As soon as Claire returns home, she keeps throwing a tantrum. Nonetheless, she has no choice but to depart for the royal capital. Later that night, Sid meets with the Seven Shadows to discuss their next mission, only to be told they will leave him. From the looks of it, the Seven Shadows discovered that the Cult of Diablos operates on a larger scale, so they decided to split up to take them down. In the end, Sid let them go while thinking the girls grew tired of their role-playing. Two years passed, and Sid enrolled in the same academy as his sister. As expected, he keeps a low profile and chooses Skell and Poe as friends, both at the bottom of the noble's ladder. On the way to the academy, the duo reminds Sid about his punishment for scoring the lowest on the test. Talk about public humiliation. Our MC has to confess love to the campus bell and deal with a brutal rejection. Speaking of the most sought-after girl, they witness Princess Alexia Midgar rejecting another guy upon their arrival at the academy. Before the night falls, he executes his plan, acting all timid in front of Alexia with the two potato heads watching in the background. Sid confesses to the princess, and much to his surprise, she accepts his feelings. Safe to say that the news of their dating spread like wildfire, leaving the students staring daggers at Sid. While they still can't believe yesterday's plot twist, Alexia she joins their table at the cafeteria. Having seated with the royalty, they get served with lots of food in a desperate attempt to get dumped. Sid gobbles up the food until he notices Alexia cracking a smile. Sometime later, Xin and Griffey, their sword instructor, introduce Sid to the other students as the newest member of Section 1. Thanks to Alexia's influence, he got out of the lowest section. Minutes later, Sid and Alexia spar with each other, and the former notices that her swordsmanship skills could be better, although he finds it bland. On the other hand, Alexia shares the same sentiments about Sid skills, but she somehow feels annoyed as she sees herself at him. Just as they finish the training session, Zeman enters the picture, revealing that he is Alexia's fiance. Later that day, the couple meets to set the record straight about their relationship. There and then, Sid realizes that Alexia chose him as her boyfriend because he is a low-rank noble who she believes is easy to manipulate. She wants to continue their boyfriend and girlfriend setup until Zeman breaks off their engagement. While Sid claims he doesn't want to get mixed up with other people's problems, let alone attract more unnecessary attention. He instantly changes his mind when Alexia throws a gold coin in haste. He takes it like a dog catching a frisbee. Sid grabs the second coin with his mouth, which seals the deal. Days pass, and their fake relationship continues, irking the male students. However, Xenon seems nonchalant about their public display of affection. Two weeks have passed since they started dating, but they're still not progressing. Inside the train, Alexia confesses that she has always wanted to catch up to her sister Iris, who's been their family's pride. When it comes to defending, despite all her efforts to be stronger, her sister is miles ahead of her. To make her feel any better, Sid admits that he likes Alexia's sword skills, to which she replies that she already heard the exact words from Iris when she suffered a humiliating defeat at a tournament. Wallowing in self-pity, Alexia draws her sword. As the tension rises between the two, the train stops, and she bids him goodbye. At that point, Sid guesses it's the end of their relationship. The following day, Xenon and his subordinates approach Sid. It appears that Alexia did not return to her dormitory last night, and since Sid is the last person she was with, he becomes the primary suspect in the case of a potential kidnapping. Sid is surrounded by several knights in mere seconds, leaving him no choice but to surrender. Elsewhere, Alexia wakes up, restrained with magic ceiling chains. Next to her cell, she notices a female humanoid monster. Eerily enough, a mad doctor turns up, seemingly excited to get a sample of her royal blood. Barely gathering her wits, Alexia asks the doctor why he needs her blood, to which he says that she possesses the necessary demon blood to resurrect their master. At the same time, Sid is getting beaten to a pulp during his interrogation about Alexia's whereabouts. For the record, Sid can bear the pain, but since he doesn't want the minor characters to outshine him, he lets out a blood-curdling scream, pleading with his tormentors to spare his life. Meanwhile, Xena meets with Iris and apologizes for his shortcomings because he feels responsible for Alexia's disappearance. 
When they talk about Sid as the suspect, Zenon stresses that although the evidence points to him as the culprit, his skill level wouldn't stand a chance against Alexia. Fortunately, Iris orders Sid's release, but they will still closely watch him. The next scene pans over to Claire, who's getting tackled by a group of students as she demands to speak with the Knights about their unjust arrest of her brother Rose. Oriana, the student council president, interferes to stop her. Finally released, the badly beaten Sid goes straight to his dorm, aware he's being followed. Out of nowhere, he runs into Alpha, who saves in the trouble of getting rid of his pursuers. Inside his room, Alpha informs Sid that they are still gathering more information about the cult and their organization is growing steadily. According to Sid, the girls still visit him from time to time, which makes him glad. Alpha then reveals that the cult took Alexia because of her royal blood. When she suggests disposing of the men who interrogated Sid, he protests against it, claiming that they only did their job. At night, Sid excitedly sets up his eminence in the shadow room. He can create the perfect ambience thanks to the stolen treasures and his earnings from being a fake boyfriend. Later that night, Beta arrives at his doorstep. Having a central character moment, Sid declares that the time has come. Just as he leaves his dorm, he's greeted by two knights, who throw Alexia's boot to set him up. While the joke's on them as the lifeless bodies of their lookouts drop to the ground. In a short while, the knights follow their comrades to the afterlife. Amidst the chaos taking over the city, the madman rushes to the cell and injects something into the humanoid monster. Alexia warns the doctor not to do it, but he turns a deaf ear, and thus, the disfigured creature evolves and takes his life. Surprisingly, she helps Alexia escape. Looking for a way out, she bumps into Xenon, who confesses that he owns the facility and funded the doctor's research in exchange for getting promoted. In the Knights of Rounds, Xenon handed his fiance to the cult. Infuriated, Alexia charges at him, but he easily blocks her attacks. Using her sister's technique, she manages to wound Xenon's arm, only to be disarmed in return. As Alexia slowly accepts her tragic fate, Sid introduces himself as a shadow. Xenon immediately recognizes him as the vigilant going after the cult. Claiming shadow only targets their weak minions, Xenon warns him that he's about to face one of the cult's core members. Xenon lunges at him, acting all high and mighty, but he misses his target. Just then, Shadow appears behind him, asking, where's the court's member he bragged about? Switching to another clash, the monster starts wreaking havoc in the city, overwhelming the knights. Despite landing a solid hit on her body, she keeps healing herself. Iris intervenes, launching powerful strikes, but it's a futile effort. That is until Alpha appears at the scene and mutters that Iris is making the monster suffer. And so Alpha takes it upon herself to put the monster out of her misery. Just as the blinding light disappears, the beast returns to her true nature as a human, or more specifically, as Nilia, Greece's daughter. Before Alpha leaves, she tells Iris she can be a spectator. As the Shadow Garden deals with the situation, taking the battle more seriously, Xenon musters more magical power and manages to push Shadow back. He takes his chance and goes all out on the offensive, but Shadow still overpowers him. In the middle of the intense swordsmanship display, Alexia realizes she's watching the sword play she's been aiming to master. Desperate to prove himself worthy to be called the cult's core member, Xenon swallows the red pills. After the dramatic transformation, Xenon states he's the third awakened. For all that, Shadow holds out against his destructive power and turns him into his punching bag. As Shadow summons a magic barrier, Xenon goes frantic and attempts to launch a sneak attack. However, his sword breaks into smithereens. With that, Shadow unleashes a massive explosion, leaving a vast crater in the middle of the city. Unaware that Shadow is her ex-boyfriend, Alexia tries to copy his technique until Iris interrupts her and pulls her in for a hug. Seeing how worried Iris is about her, Alexia reconciles with her sister. The next day, Alexia and Sid are spotted hanging out in school with Xenon. Taken out of the picture, the princess asks Sid if they can resume their relationship as lovers. For the first time in her life, Alexia suffers rejection. She did not take it lightly though, as the wall turned bloody red. Soon afterward, the Shadow Garden ladies gather for an emergency meeting. While they celebrate their master's victory, another problem arises, and this time, an unknown group is pretending to be Shadow Garden and delivering their own version of justice. Now that Iris is aware of the cults in Shadow Garden's existence, she appoints her trusted knights, Glenn and Marco, to be part of her new investigation team. Iris orders them to find someone to identify the mysterious relic they found in the incident location. Speaking of which, a pink-haired girl named Sherry Barnett is seen looking at the item in a book until she bumps into Sid sporting an early Halloween look. Sherry, who turns out to be a brilliant researcher, is summoned by Iris to study the relic while having second thoughts. Because she's still a student Leatherin, Sherry's adoptive father encourages her to accept the challenge. Ultimately, she agrees and Iris assigns the new team, Crimson Order, to watch over her. Alexia volunteers to be part of it, and Iris gives her permission. On a lighter note, the chaotic trio visits a department store, but is welcomed by a long queue. Suddenly, a lady approaches Sid and asks him 
to participate in a survey. He agrees and leaves Skell and Poe waiting at the end of the line. Later, the woman leads him to a large door, and behind it is a mansion enclosed by the store. Another door opens, revealing a throne room where Sid sees Gamma, one of the Seven Shadows. Turns out that she's the owner of the establishment, inspired by Sid's story about his previous life. He remembers sharing random stuff about his world with the girls at that instant. Sid acknowledges Gamma as the smartest among the Seven, but she's a non-athletic type, and her falling down the stairs is the proof. Feeding her master's ego, she asks him to sit on the throne, and Sid loves it as he feels like a king. When Gamma gets asked about the status of her business, she proudly mentions that they already have multiple franchises operating across the city. Shortly afterward, shocking Sid, she presented a pile of gold coins at the organization's disposal. Shifting to a different topic, Gamma speaks about the people masquerading as Shadow Garden. She assures Sid that they are doing everything to capture the perpetrators. He then remembers his unfortunate encounter with Alexia. Even though he's still connecting the dots, he declares that he has figured it all out. Shortly, Gamma introduces Nu as the newest elite member of the Shadows. Before leaving, Sid says he wants to buy some chocolate, but Gamma offers it for free. He steals a single coin as he distracts the ladies with his annoying laugh. Sid thinks Alexia has gone mad after giving her a taste of her medicine. Sensing her presence nearby, Sid claims he's about to poop, forcing his friends to leave him, battling his ordeal alone because of the curfew. Not long after a gut-wrenching scene, Sid heads straight to the back alley. There he sees the wounded Alexia cornered by three men pretending to be Shadow Garden members. Just as they're about to add her to their victims, Shadow intervenes, taking one of them down for tainting the name of Shadow Garden. He chases after the remaining two, and another one bites the dust. When he's about to finish them off, New shows up and requests she handle the last guy for interrogation. Elsewhere, Gaunt Knight, the outlaw's leader, learns that his underlings have been dealt with. He's unbothered, stressing that retrieving the relic is their top priority. Alexia meets Iris and informs her that the culprit is Shadow Garden's imposter. However, Iris still believes Shadow Garden and the cult are enemies of the kingdom. Funnily enough, another rumor about Sid spreads quickly. Even though he made it all up, the students poked fun at him for filling his pants last night. The duo, who swore they would keep it a secret, nervously asks Sid if he has the chocolate. Despite their betrayal, they still receive chocolates, intending to give them to their crushes. Skill goes first and confesses to the girl he was smitten with, only to be confronted by her fans. When Poe tries his luck, the girl runs off, screaming that her stalker is at it again. Caught up in a background character moment, Sid gives his chocolate to the first girl he sees. Coincidentally enough, he gives it to Sherry and abruptly leaves. At home, Sherry wonders about what happened in the library until her father comes into her room and notices the chocolates. After learning that a boy gave her the sweets, Lutheran tells his knave daughter it's a love confession. Still processing her thoughts and emotions, Lutheran says that Sherry's admirer is waiting for her answer, disguised as a student. New reports to Sid about the cult members she held captive. Unfortunately, she couldn't get any information from the man because someone brainwashed him until he completely lost it. While New states that the enemies use orphans as foot soldiers, known as children of Diablos, Sid's mind is preoccupied with the fencing tournament his friends signed him up for. She then mentions Rex, one of the children who maintains self-awareness despite being subjected to brain Washing. Still distracted, Sid asks Nu to give him some time to think. Soon enough, the tournament kicks off with Claire emerging victorious against her opponent. For the next matchup, Sid is pitted against Rose. As soon as the referee begins the fight, both parties charge forward until Sid takes out fake blood, allowing his opponent to hit him, calling the trick a bloody tornado. He keeps standing back up. After flying into the arena countless times and coughing fake blood, Sid awaits Rose's finishing move. That is until the referee stops the fight and the defending champion is proclaimed the winner. While the medical team takes Sid to the infirmary, Rose mutters that he earned her respect for his unwavering spirit. After receiving treatment, Sherry approaches Sid, praising the courage and determination he displayed in the battle. She then gives him some cookies and suggests they start out as friends. Despite the confusion, Sid agrees to whatever Sherry is insinuating. As if their situation wasn't more awkward, Lutheran joined their table. Unwilling to get acquainted with meaningful characters, he uses his injuries to excuse himself. Sometime later, Sherry meets Alexia. While the princess assumes Sherry visited her to discuss the relic, she asks if she's still going out with Sid. Alexia admits they have broken up, and they were never romantically involved with each other. Hearing this, Sherry feels relieved as she can now concentrate on her research. However, Alexia feels otherwise as she struggles to keep her composure. A few days later, Sid notices that most students treat him nicely, while immersed 
engrossed in his thoughts, Rose and her assistant enter the room to discuss the upcoming election. The Gaunt Knight begins his plan elsewhere, encapsulating the whole academy in a barrier. As expected, Sid is the only one aware of what's happening. Arriving at the school gate, Alexia is shocked to see the guard lifeless on the ground. Meanwhile, Sid notices he's having trouble using his magic until the children of Diaplos barge into the room. Still masquerading as Shadow Garden, they announce they will take over the academy, prompting Rose to raise her sword. Her magic isn't working, to her dismay, and before she knows it, the enemies destroy her weapon. Taking advantage of the situation, one of them tries to end her life, but Sid jumps into the scene to protect her, unaware that Sid only saved her, to play the role of a background character who dies first. Rose mistakenly thinks that the former cared for her. After that, the enemies drag the students into the auditorium. Left for dead, Sid pounds his chest until he successfully revives himself. With his magic still obstructed, he turns it into threads to counter the magic ceiling barrier. While Sherry is studying the relic, Rex breaks into her window to retrieve the item. Thankfully, before he can hurt Sherry, Glenn parries the blow with his sheer strength. Marco, also facing someone, tells Sherry to flee the scene with the barrier's threat. Iris hesitates to command her men to rescue the students. On the other hand, Sid shoots down the enemies from the rooftop to kill time, while waiting for the night to strike. At the same time, he spots Sherry walking freely in the building as if the school isn't surrounded by bad guys. This could have been her last exposure in the series if it weren't for Sid's slimes. She then trips by the stairs, forcing Sid to catch her alone. He gives her an earful before they head to her father's room, where she finds the book she's been looking for. Identifying the artifact as the Eye of Averis, Sherry says it absorbs magical energy, rendering the knights powerless. To make matters worse, she discovers that it will explode once the artifact fills itself up. Having said that, Sherry reveals that the relic she's studying can counter the Eye of Averis as it can store an immense amount of magical energy. On his way to get the tools Sherry needs, Sid runs into Rex and some small fry. He immediately gets rid of his escorts and pushes him back. Thinking that Sid is using some relic to boost his speed, Rex summons a net barrier to detect his movements, only to fail big time. The smug look on his face quickly fades when he notices that he's surrounded by his life allies. And just like that, Rex counts himself in. A while later, a newcomer comes across the Crimson Order members. Glenn did not make it while Marco was severely wounded. It is then revealed that Marco was her betrothed. As she contemplates what to do with him, Sid collects the tools. While he's at it, New informs him that the reinforcements have arrived and they're just waiting for his orders. As she stresses how risky it is to initiate the rescue operations, Sid asks for her help to search for the rest of the materials. Once he leaves, New decides to spare Marco's life. After refining the relic, Sherry leads Sid to a secret passage connecting to the auditorium. Just then, she recalls her mother's death. In another flashback, as Sherry stood before her mother's grave, Lutheran stayed by her side for her significant contributions to the field of research. Lutheran took in Sherry as his own child. Determined to return the favor, she promised to help her father in whichever way she could. Back to the present, Sherry walks into the tunnel alone. Inside the auditorium, she activates the relic, nullifying the effects of the Eye of Averis. With their magic back, the knights retaliate, turning the place into a battle arena. Of course, Sid, channeling his shadow persona, won't let them have fun alone as he descends from the glass ceiling. Also, the actual Shadow Garden arrives to lend him a hand as the students start evacuating. The Gaunt Knight sets the auditorium on fire before he retreats. Once outside, Iris asks Rose about what happened, to which she says that Shadow Garden saved them from the group of the same name. With her statement, Iris grows more suspicious about Shadow Garden's motives. Still inside the auditorium, Sherry frantically searches for Lutheran. Speaking of her father, Sid confronts him, revealing that he is none other than the Skeletal Knight. When he's asked why he committed such atrocities, Lutheran confesses he was once a sword playmaster until he became sick. Desperate to cure his illness, he exhausted all his resources and found the artifact. With the help of Sherry's mother, he funded her research and confirmed the artifact's power. However, since the Eye of Averis could be destructive, she insisted on surrendering it to the government. And so Lutheran took her life, and the unsuspecting Sherry continued her mother's research. Sid suggests they settle the score between them, but Lutheran sends him plummeting to the ground in a snap of a finger. Just as he bids him farewell, Shadow keeps him company, knowing that he's no match against Shadow. Lutheran combines the Control Relic and the Eye of Averis, successfully regaining his strength as the top swordsman. Like Xenon, the older man is all bark and no bite as Shadow effortlessly blocks his aggressive charges. Standing in the same spot in a vain attempt to make Shadow put his guard down, Lutheran reveals that he has already made arrangements for him and his organization to take the blame for the crimes he committed. Unfazed, Shadow declares that he doesn't care because Shadow Garden doesn't exist 
exist to protect the kingdom. Instead, it's walking on its own path. After the speech, Shadow punishes Lutheran with the same method he used on Sherry's mother. Seeing her father gone, Sherry bawls her eyes out. Since Shadow believes that it's better if Sherry doesn't know anything, he leads her be. Sometime after the incident, the Shadow Garden becomes the kingdom's sworn enemy. Following this announcement, the ruined academy grants an early summer break. With both her parents gone, Sherry informs Sid she'll be studying abroad to start anew and pursue different research. He then asks her about her new goal, but she refuses to divulge it, stressing it's a secret. Sherry exudes a sinister aura. During the summer break, Sid receives a letter from Apha summoning him to the sacred land Lindworm. The following scene shows Epsilon, the fifth member of the Seven Shadows, seemingly excited to start her day. Through Sid's teachings, she can alter her body features with slime magic. Shifting to the events after the fake shadow garden got wiped out, Rose rushed to the infirmary in tears. She held Sid's hand, accepted his feelings, and offered him her heart. Inside the train bound for Lindform, the unexpected couple is spotted traveling together. Well, they only chanced upon each other at the train station. Upon arriving at their destination, a keychain with a left demonic arm pierced with a sword draws Sid's attention. Rose explains they are in the city where the hero, Olivier, cuts off Diablo's left arm. She adds that within the Lindworm area lies the sanctuary ruins, which the locals believe is where Diablo's left arm got sealed away. Strolling around, they come across a book signing event of a famous author, Natsum. Exhilarated, Rose falls in line to get the signature of her favorite author. While checking the books, Sid notices that the content were plagiarized from his previous world. Thinking that there's another person who reincarnated there, Sid lines up until he's greeted by Beta Join Gamma as they make a living out of his wisdom. At the cathedral, Alpha is seen standing beside a statue in the lifeless body of Archbishop Drake. She leaves the place at once. When knights show up later that night, Sid catches sight of a cloaked man running on the rooftop. He hurriedly runs after him and deflects his attack. Epsilon then intervenes and delivers the decisive blow before they part ways. She reports that their target was attacked by the cult's execution executioner, who managed to escape due to unforeseen circumstances. Epsilon declares they will move to plan B. It goes without saying that Sid will proceed with his own plans. Feeling confident about his physique, Sid plunges into the hot spring as Alexia tries to gather herself together. When the princess is asked why she's in Lindworm, she says she's a special guest for the goddess's trial. Answering the same question, Sid claims a friend invited him to watch the event. Alexia explains that the goddess's trial is a fighting ritual where challengers participate to face ancient warriors from the sanctuary. She shares that the wandering swordsman Venom unexpectedly summoned Olivier before, but he lost against the hero soon enough. The goddess's trial commences through the initiative of the new acting archbishop, Jack Nelson. Before opening the event, Nelson drove Alexia away as he refused to be audited, stressing that she was supposed to investigate the late archbishop and not him. In a short while, a magic circle appears in the battle arena and envelops the area with a barrier. Tote Baterius from the Oriana Kingdom steps in as the first contender, but not a single soul emerges from the sanctuary, indicating that the warrior is not deemed worthy. As the participants continue to fail the summoning ritual, Sid can't help but imagine the gate crashing the competition as the mysterious man. Much to his disappointment, the event doesn't allow walk-in contenders. Unbeknownst to Sid, Rose registered his name as one of the participants, hoping to impress her father with his potential. Completely aware that once he steps inside the arena, a spirit on par with his strength might emerge, he resolves to participate as Shadow. To everyone's shock, he summons Aurora, the Witch of Calamity, the most powerful witch in history. Both are flashing a smirk. Aurora initiates the battle with her bloody spears, forcing Shadow to be on the defensive. After dodging all her attacks, he concludes the battle in his favor, one hit his opponent. Shadow could only wish he could have fought Aurora when she was alive and in full power. After his flawless victory, he immediately disappears, baffling the audience. Shortly, the barrier collapses and a portal pops up in the arena. Following the odd occurrence, Sith notices that a portal is beside him. As it won't stop bugging him, he enters the magic door. Moving on to the separate portal, Nelson cancels the goddess trial and commands his men to escort the crowd outside as he tries to convince Alexia and Sid's other simps to leave the Shadow Garden. Ladies welcome his sight. Alpha and her team enter the portal first, while Epsilon and the rest take Gamma as a hostage to persuade Nelson to go with them. While Rose worries for her safety, Alexia doesn't buy her terrible acting. Refusing to yield, Nelson calls upon Venom, who instantly attacks Epsilon even though her slime cushion saves her. He lashes out at Venom for exposing her secret, turning him into a chopping block. Consequently, Epsilon drags Nelson into the portal, and the rest of them follow, including Alexia and Rose. Once inside the sanctuary, Alpha leads them to Olivier's statue, which turns out to 
be an elven girl bearing a striking resemblance to her. Nelson knows that they have been possessed before, which Sid once called the demon's curse. Walking further into the sanctuary, Alpha opens another door and leads them to the graveyard of the ancient heroes. Alongside Olivia herself, Alpha dives deeper into the sanctuary. Elsewhere, Sid stumbles upon Aurora, who denies that she summoned him. The witch notes she enjoyed their battle, and Sid tells the same. After a chat, he frees Aurora from her restraints and agrees to work with her to find the exit. She then reveals that the sanctuary is a prison where the ancient hero's memories are stored. Aurora claims that the magical core must be destroyed for her to be free. However, they can't use magic inside, as the realm absorbs their power. Sid assures Aurora that he's good at breaking things. Looking into Olivia's memory, they witness how the cult gathered orphans and subjected them to unsettling experiments. Most of the children did not make it, and a few girls survived, including Olivia, who was proven compatible with Diablo's cells. As Nelson puts it, they had no choice since they needed to create a powerful being to stand against the demon used as a pawn. Olivia followed their orders to extract more of Diablo's cells, backed up by the cult's collection of artifacts. In connection, the red pills came from Diablo's cells. Unsatisfied with the pill's effects, the young Nelson created the beads of Diablo's, capable of granting tremendous power and a body that will never age. While Lexia believes its side effect is hair loss, Nelson states he's bald because of stress. Alpha chimes in, revealing the beads' two flaws. Firstly, they need to take it once a year. Secondly, the supply is limited, which explains why the Knights of Rounds only have 12 members. Since they have not perfected the formula, the cult relies on Diablo's cells and the hero's descendants, like Alpha herself. Calling Nelson the 11th of the rounds, he berserk, but before he can fully transform, Delta pierces his body and throws him down the water. All hell breaks loose when Nelson comes out alive, splitting the group and trapping them in different memories. With that, Alpha and Delta face the demonic Nelson, generating multiple clones of himself. Although Delta quickly takes down the clones, she realizes her power is slowly draining. Apparently, the closer they get to the center of the sanctuary, the weaker they become and the stronger Nelson gets. Sid and Aurora find themselves in another memory, a war zone filled with casualties. There, they run into her younger version, crying uncontrollably. Aurora decides to end her and delete the painful memory, but the corpses suddenly rise from the dead, attacking them. At that moment, Aurora deduces that the sanctuary is rejecting them. Switching to Epsilon's group, they come across the sanctuary's archive and discover documents about the possessed. Along with the other files, they take pictures of them to show why they have a camera. Ada, the seventh member of the Shadow and a scientist, introduces the device to their world again, thanks to Shadow's knowledge. Despite the magic depletion, Sid and Aurora defeat several zombies, but unfortunately, they just keep coming. With that, Sid claims the life of the young Aurora, and the memory shatters. Soon afterward, they reach the sanctuary center, going on a rampage. Delta proves herself in a lee as she obliterates Nelson's clones. Despite being futile, he summons more clones, only to be wiped out in seconds. As it seems, the magical core lies behind the door, locked up in chains. While Sid notes that the chain will only break his sword, Aurora tells him that the holy sword in front of them is the key. However, he can't pull it out when he tries to lift the weapon. Looking at the magical inscription, Aurora confirms that only the chosen one or the hero's descendants hold the right to wield the holy sword. While the two take a break, resting does not exist in Delta's dictionary as she continues to dominate Nelson's copies. After beating over a hundred clones, the memory collapses and they get transported elsewhere. Refusing to back down, Nelson calls on Olivia to fight. At the same time, Epsilon cuts in and announces that they have finished the investigation. For this reason, they leave the fuming Nelson and return to the outside world. Just then, the Archbishop gets notified that someone has infiltrated the Sanctuary Center. Going by the typical stories, Sid expects the main protagonist to arrive and lift the sword, but much to his disappointment, Nelson and his shining forehead show up. He quickly notices that Alpha and Olivia look identical. Upon Nelson's request, Olivia charges Sid and dominates the battle. Witnessing the one-sided fight, Aurora steps in and stops him. Nelson then declares he will Will spare Sid's life if she cooperates with their research. Aurora considers Nelson's offer as she implies that Sid doesn't stand a chance against Olivia. Safe to say that our MC takes offense, and thus he keeps provoking Nelson. Angered, Nelson commands Olivia to finish him off, and so she does. While Olivia wears a deadpan expression, Aurora looks terrified, and Nelson flashes a wide grin. Sid cracks an evil smile with his eyes glowing. After intentionally guiding her sword to miss his vital organs, Sid restrains Olivia and bites her neck. Having taken care of Olivia, he slowly walks toward Nelson until he pulls another trick up his sleeve. Taking advantage of the vast magical energy in the sanctuary center, Nelson summons several of Olivier's clones. The cheap copies shatter upon opening his right eye, leaving Nelson's jaws open. It is then revealed that Sid compressed his magic into a solid mass so it wouldn't be absorbed. Having had enough of Nelson's repetitive tricks, Sid activates his ultimate spell, destroying the magic core and the entire sanctuary itself. Waking up in the woods with Aurora by his 
side, she confesses that she actually summoned Sid. She apologizes for lying and expresses gratitude for helping her find her peace before Aurora disappears. She says one day Sid might chance upon the real her. Given the present circumstances, Alexia and Rose decide to form their own organization to unravel the mysteries surrounding the cult and the Shadow Garden as Natsumbeta joins to keep a close watch on their movement. Some time later, Alpha and Epsilon talked about the information they obtained in the Sanctuary's archive. Turns out that Aurora has another name, the Demon Diablos, while Epsilon suggests reporting it to Shadow. Alpha tells her he knows it all along. Meanwhile, Alexia reports to Iris about the late and the present Archbishop's involvement with the cult. Thinking that there's a more influential organization backing them up, Alexia plans to investigate the Church of the Divine Teachings. Iris then admits that she already suggested it to their father, only to be told to stand aside because of political matters. As a resolve, Iris vows to win the Bushin Festival, an international fencing tournament, so as to earn the support of the general public and be heard by their father. Under the rain, Rose is seen training until she feels something is off, revealing a demonic mark on her chest. The day of the Bushin Festival finally arrives, with the strongest warriors around the world gathering in the royal capital. As expected, Sid has already pictured how he would play his character well. He's planning to act weak. When the crowd starts booing and his opponent declares a premature victory, he will surprise everyone with an epic comeback win. To begin, Sid asks for Gamma's assistance. To help him pull off the best disguise, she applies a special slime on his face and shows him some pictures for reference. Opting for a weak look, Gamma suggests copying Mundane Man, an unskilled Dark Knight who was disowned by his family. Sadly, when he died, nobody in the world cared. With his face befitting his background story, Sid chooses to be immersed in his character as mundane. He changes his posture before stepping outside. Anuros, a participant from the goddess's trial who summoned an ancient warrior, bumps into a mundane in the streets. Seeing him for the first time, she suggests he forgets to compete in the tournament. As a response, Mundane tells Aneros not to judge a book by its cover, attracting more attention. A man named Quentin advises Mundane to rethink his decision and not spoil the fun of the festival. With an annoying look, Mundane tells the big guy that he's stronger than him. Fuming, Quentin starts beating him. Unwilling to go against his plotted story, Mundane lies on the ground. Fortunately, Anaro stops Quentin and apologizes to Mundane for not stepping in earlier. Later that night, Sid runs into Rose, who tells him that her father has chosen the man she will marry, a high-ranking noble named Pervishat. However, her deplorable situation doesn't end there, as her family urges her to give up being a dark knight. As Sid assures Rose that he'll always believe her, her gloomy expression wears off. The following day, Skell drags Sid to watch the preliminary fights for more chances of winning the bet. The former collects data after each battle while Skell blabs on and on about his strategy. Goldie, a proud and undefeated knight, advises him on how to predict the winner flawlessly. Sid leaves the two as the referee announces the next matchup. Gonzalez versus Mundane. As soon as Mundane enters the ring, Goldie says Gonzalez will win in less than a second. Skell, seemingly impressed by Goldie's ability to assess the warrior's battle power, gets taken aback when Mundane is announced as the winner. Hence, the crowd complains, wanting to get their money back to save face. Goldie claims that Gonzalez tripped and fell during their fight, and he predicted it. Honoros, on the other hand, changes her tune about Mundane after seeing the two solid punches that knocked out his opponent. With Goldie facing Mundane for tomorrow's match, Skell asks Sid for money because he plans to bet on the self-professed battle analyst to help his friend save money. He refuses. The next day, Skell rushes to inform City that Rose stabbed her fiance and ran off. Following the news, Beta and Alexia, as sworn allies, decide to investigate the matter. Unbeknownst to the latter, Beta is conducting her own investigation and has just learned Rose's whereabouts. Later that day, Sid encounters Beatrix, another elven girl searching for her late sister's daughter. Claiming that her niece is a pretty girl who looks like her, Beatrix doffs her hood. She reminds her of Alpha at that instant, but he chooses not to say anything. Suddenly, she draws her sword, acting as if he's scared stiff. Sid staggers and falls. Beatrix says sorry and rubs it in his face that she mistakenly thought he was strong. While watching a match, Quentin approaches Anaros and asks about her opinion of the mundane. Turns out that he was also watching when he quickly ended the fight, as mundane suddenly piques their interest. After belittling him, they anticipate his battle with Goldie. Speaking of which, Anaros reveals that Goldie's undefeated because he is wise when choosing his opponents. As she puts it, he only fights those he believes are inferior to his skills. Truth be told, he messed up. This time, Goldie initiates the battle. Mundane isn't in the mood, yet as he cracks his neck, and at the same time, dodges his attack. Strangely enough, the former feels that Mundane cuts his tummy when he's just standing there, slowly unsheathing his sword. Irritated, Goldie resorts to using his secret sword 
Sacred Art, only to be countered by a sneeze. And just like that, Goldie's magic attack leads him to a crushing defeat, ruining his record. Elsewhere, Iris visits Perv to hand him the security plan for the main event of the Bushin Festival. She offers her trusted Lance of Knights for his increased security, but he declines. She then notices that Perv is in excellent condition compared to what's been published in the news. Perv tells Iris that he will deal with the pressing problem alone, just like how she rescued her sister Alexia. As Rose's father commands Iris to let Perv do as he wishes, her suspicions about him grow even more. Mundane finally avenges Quinton back at the arena, who gets humbled quickly. With his latest win, he secured a spot in the main tournament. Anaros, his next opponent, approaches him and tries to intimidate him. Wearing his signature smirk, he removes one of his armor plates, revealing that it's heavy as the ground cracks after it lands. The next scene shows Rose inside a tunnel, running away from the knights, and after she walks in the streets, Sid hears a piano playing and is reminded of his childhood. Even though he was forced to play the instrument, he enjoyed it. That is until he recognizes his favorite piece playing in the background, the Moonlight Sonata. Just as Sid believes this time he will meet someone from his previous world, he sees Epsilon on the piano joining Gamma and Beta. Epsilon shares that she has built connections with influential people throughout her career and even received rewards for her compositions or, more accurately, plagiarized works. Hearing this, Sid doesn't know exactly what to feel. Although Beta tried to stall Alexia from finding Rose for her own sake, the princess eventually figured she might be hiding in the underground passages. Slumping to the ground, Rose recalls how the king welcomed her when she got summoned for the announcement of her engagement. When Rose saw her father, she knew something was wrong to bad. Even the knights seemingly lost themselves as they flashed a sinister smile. In the end, the cult member Perv, whom she had no idea how he brainwashed everyone, framed her up. As she considers turning herself in to prevent a war between the kingdoms of Midgar and Oriana and save her father, he remembers Sid and wonders if he still believes in her. Just then, the signs of possession grow more apparent as her body changes. Suddenly, the Moonlight Sonata plays. Rose follows the music and leads him to Shadow playing on the piano. Upon finishing the piece, Shadow asks Rose what she desires to accomplish, to which Rose says she wants to protect the people she holds dear. Seeing her resolve, Shadow grants Rose immense power and frees her from the possession. After giving her a pep talk, Shadows leave, signaling the entrance of the cult members with her newly found power. Rose ends them with a single slash. Sensing the unusual burst of magical energy, Alexia and Beta search for its source until they find Rose. Alexia then bombards her with questions about the magic and the news about her. Still, she refuses to answer, stressing that she doesn't want to drag her into her mess for failing to keep her promise that they won't keep a secret. Alexia resolves to use force to make Rose speak. After beating Alexia, Rose leads her to Beta as she decides to stop hiding to fight for what she believes in, for always avoiding her and making her wait the whole day. Claire beats Sid once she settles her nerves. She hands her brother a ticket for the main tournament. It appears that she replaced Rose after the controversy at the venue. Sid finds out that the ticket Claire gave her is for VIP seating. Shortly, he finds himself seated beside Iris, who tells him she's planning to absorb Claire to her personal order. Once she graduates, Iris takes the opportunity to apologize to Sid for the trouble Alexia in her ex fiance Zenon, caused him. When the students asked Iris about her personal favorite among the participants, she mentioned Anna Rose. Even so, she has no plan to lose against anyone. Sid chimes in, asking if Mundane caught her attention too, but the students state that the guy is unskilled and just lucky. Sid can't contain his excitement as the buildup he set up for Mundane's reputation is going as smoothly as he planned. Iris then speaks about the war goddess Beatrix, who turns out to be the first ever Bushin Festival champion. Unfortunately, the elven swordmaster won't be competing this year. Sid believes that Beatrix is strong like her niece, but he doesn't expect her to be famous. Sensing a powerful presence nearby, Sid excuses himself for a second. Soon afterward, he stumbles upon Beatrix again. She keeps asking him about the elf she's been looking for but he keeps mum. Sometime later, Perv sits on Sid's vacant seat and informs Iris that the king is in bad shape but will attend tomorrow's event. Iris shares that her father, Klaus, will also watch tomorrow. The next match grabs their attention as Anna Rose steps into the arena with noteworthy skills. Perv expresses his interest in the young fencer, planning to invite her to serve under his kingdom. When Iris is asked about her opinion of Mundane, she notes that she has yet to see him fight. The referee finally starts the battle from the get-go to let her see Mundane's battle prowess. Anoros goes for short-range combat. She aggressively attacks, but Mundane's speed overwhelms her, pairing and evading all her charges. Upon seeing an opening, Anoros attempts to finish him, only to swing her sword in the air. In a short while, Mundane strikes the first blow. She changes her strategy to focus on counterattack, but it's utterly pointless. Hence, Mundane slays another tournament favorite. Following her MC's victory, he will face Iris, which leads Perv to ask her if she's confident in winning the battle against the tournament's dark horse. While Iris acknowledges Mundane's beautiful
beautiful swordplay, she points out that she's still on a different level. Seeing Mundane potentially threaten his plans, Perv orders his henchmen to investigate him. At the VIP section, Iris stops the guards, forbidding Beatrix from entering the area, and declares she is her guest. All the while, the guys didn't know that she was the legendary elf swordmaster. Once the words spread out, people flock around her. She takes her chance and asks each one of them about her missing niece, but to no avail. Meanwhile, at the castle, Perv forces the king to swallow liquid that makes him obey every single order from the former, as it seems he's planning to use the king to go against the father of the Midgar sisters and spark a war. If everything goes according to his plan, the puppet leader Perv arranged beforehand will take Klaus' throne. After the investigation of Mundane, Perv still has no idea about his identity. While searching for their seat, they pass by Iris and Beatrix, with the latter stating that the king smells terrible. Exasperated, Perv raises his voice at Beatrix. Iris immediately interferes and informs Perv that her guest is the war goddess. At that point, he deduces that she might have awakened the hero's blood, adding her to his list of potential threats. After Claire's victory, Iris heads to the arena for her match against Mundane. Aiming to one-shot her opponent, Iris musters her strength until she sees a spine-chilling image of herself dying a horrible death, as if her body moved independently. Iris backs away from the Mundane as she tries to pull herself together. Another illusion leaves her distraught with fear. At the same time, Rose makes her way to the VIP section until she comes across slain cult members in the Shadow Garden, then turns up before her eyes with Beta telling Rose to carry out her mission. As Iris keeps chickening out, the crowd goes furious. Consequently, she goes super shy in mode and lunges at Mundane. To her shock, she notices that he hasn't even unsheathed his sword. At the speed of light, Mundane disarms Iris and he's proclaimed the winner. Following his daughter's loss, Klaas exits the venue. While Perv can't believe that Iris tastes defeat in a one-sided battle, Perv's attention immediately shifts to Rose, who has just returned. She apologizes to her father for her mistakes and what she's about to do. Against Perv's orders, the king forgives his daughter. Rose leaps toward Perv, but he uses her father as his shield. To his shock, Rose did not fall back as she freed her father from Perv's control in the most unexpected way. As she resolves to end her suffering, Perv commands his subordinates to stop her. In a trice, Mundane appears and gets rid of the cult members, thinking it's the perfect time to drop his act. Mundane transforms into shadow, but Rose ruins the atmosphere by calling him the stylish ruffling and slayer. Turns out that she was saved by him before at the hands of the bandits. From then on, Rose dreamed of becoming an excellent fencer. Shadow reminds Rose that she still needs to fulfill her mission, so she flees the scene, at once itching to fight a formidable opponent. Beatrix attacks Shadow, giving Perv his chance to escape. Seeing Shadow again, Iris screams his name with disdain. As Beatrix struggles to land a hit on Shadow's body, Iris appears to lend her a hand, wielding a mithril blade. Another artifact caught up in a 2 v one setup. Shadow couldn't be any happier. As the whole town turns into their battlefield, Iris pushes him back to a construction site, prompting him to grab crowbars there, and then he remembers Minoru Kajinu as the stylish ruffian slayer. While they are at it, Alpha offers Rose to be a member of the Shadow Garden, which she accepts. As anticipated, the combined powers of the two ladies can hold a candle to Shadow as he stomps on their wounded bodies. He finally decides to leave, but they continue to get back on their knees. Iris then warns Shadow that he just made an enemy of the entire kingdom, so he has nowhere to run to. Shadow bursts into maniacal laughter and clarifies that running away has never crossed his mind. He casts his ultimate spell, leaving their blood running cold. Ultimately, Shadow did not activate the destructive magic and vanished into thin air. Frustrated, Iris lets out a piercing cry. Sometime after the incident, the kingdom publishes news about Iris and Beatrix, driving away Shadow and piercing Shadow's picture. Far from her innocent character, Sherry vows to get even with him. In another series of events, Beatrix leaves the town empty-handed. The Shadow Garden ladies return to their routine, and Sid returns to being an average student and a typical nobody. Taking Rose to Alexandria, Shadow Garden's base of operations, she introduces the new recruit to Lambda, the organization's drill instructor, and leaves her under her care. Lambda calls Rose 666 before tearing her clothes, signaling her rebirth from being a princess to a pure soldier. The second season of our series starts with a gathering of the Shadow Group, who are supposed to fight evil organizations. They talk about how other organizations that were villains before have stopped their activities. Even groups like Diablos or Werner have ceased. This means the Shadow Organization can finally focus on the corruption happening in their city. When the girls from Kajino's Shadow Group mention a new problem, Kajino is surprised, thinking things were fine. But they tell him about suspicious money leaving the city, unsure of where it goes. They suspect the money is used for wrongdoing, and this isn't just speculation, there's evidence. 
The evidence is the appearance of the red moon, which terrifies the girls. They tell Kajino they must join him in addressing this phenomenon. But Kajino thinks they're exaggerating. It's just a red moon, no need for drama. In the lawless city, two strong fighters arrive wanting to hunt the Blood Queen. They search for the castle where she might be until they find it. They decide to enter and kill her, but before they can get close, the castle's guard, whose face is hidden, speaks to them. He says only guests, servants, or fighters can enter, and they must pass him first. This guard is not just any guard, but the White Demon, who lost an arm in a previous battle, and now kills overconfident fighters effortlessly. As soon as they approach, he kills them without effort. The next day, Kajino and his sister Claire arrive in the city, keeping a low profile as Kajino always works in secret, now considered weak by many, especially since he let his older sister Claire win, who, upon being revived, found herself as his younger sister. Since then, Claire worries about him, seeing him as a failure. She takes him to the lawless city, advising him to think about his future and career. A street vendor shouting about selling fighters catches their attention because he compliments Claire, though she wasn't interested and walks away without buying anything. Bored with sitting around, Kajina decides to explore the streets, looking for any signs of the red moon or its effects on people. He stops to eat, and people, thinking he's poor, start giving him money, which pleases him. Then he hears strange noises and finds people beating a ghoul, a vampire's assistant, next in line to become a vampire himself. The people are beating the ghoul, unable to move, until suddenly, the red moon appears. The moon activates all the magical power in the city, so the ghoul stands up, bites those hitting him, turning them into ghouls too. They approach Kajino, who stands wondering when to start hitting them until a woman thinking he's weak fights the ghoul for him. She reveals she's a vampire hunter, saved him, but asks him to move because the red moon means a terrifying night. Immediately, Kajino wears his superhero outfit named Shadow and goes out to save people from vampires, including including a woman named Mary. Mary can't believe someone arrived in time to save her and decides to flee the city. Meanwhile, Claire is crying, thinking her brother is dead, feeling guilty for bringing him to the city. But the vampire hunter, also named Mary, tells her Kajino is alive because she saw a boy fitting his description entering the Crimson Tower. This tower, home to the Blood Queen, supposed to revive by taking a young boy's blood and Kajino is the intended sacrifice. Claire, unaware of Kajino's true power, believes this and decides to join Mary to fight the tower and rescue her brother, not knowing he's freeing people inside. The lawless city has three main towers representing three opposing forces. The Crimson Tower, containing the Blood Queen's corpse, thrives on the chaos from the Red Moon, hoping their queen revives. The White Tower, ruled by the Fox Yuki, and the Black Tower, governed by Juggernaut, both aim to thwart the Crimson Tower's plan. Someone informs the Crimson Tower's ruler that their plan is failing due to interference. Initially, the ruler suspects Yuki and Juggernaut, but then learns someone is killing all ghouls, which turns out to be Kajino, whom no one can defeat. Kajino confronts the ghouls in front of Juggernaut and Yuki, surprising them, and when asked who he is, he reveals his name is Shadow. Don't forget the Crimson Tower's guard is the White Devil, who stood watching all the fighting in the city. Juggernaut and Yuki knew the name Shadow from before because he fought against corrupt merchants and priests, so none approached him. Kajino tells them the Red Moon signals destruction, so they leave leave him alone and walk away. But the white devil stood still, tied up, saying he couldn't face Yuki because she's a nine-tailed fox, a higher magical animal power. Juggernaut is well known, and no one dares approach him, so the white devil rushes to attack Kajino, thinking he's weaker. When he attacks Kajino, he realizes his mistake too late as Kajino cuts off his other hand, splits him in two, and leaves him dead. In the Crimson Tower, Claire and Mary keep walking together, wanting to save her brother. At the same time, the Shadow Garden Squad was inside the tower, with Beta looking for any useful book. Bita, from season 1, writes Kajino's adventures, so he always wants to appear as a stylish killer in front of her. Beta knew Claire, so she says they don't want to fight between them, it's pointless, and they should save their efforts for a real fight. We learn the Shadow Garden Squad wants a sample from the Blood Queen for research on curing vampirism and those bitten by them. They agree with Claire and Mary that each group will mind their business without obstructing the other until their missions are done. But then Claire starts doubting Mary, asking how she has lived so long and why she always leans towards not killing vampires. Mary refuses to answer, saying everyone has secrets, and it's best if everyone minds their business. They continue their way in the Crimson Tower until they see Juggernaut killing anyone close, so they decide to hide from him until he's done, then continue their mission. But Juggernaut senses them and goes to hit them. When Mary tries to stand against him, he hits her hard, and Claire, not strong enough, gets hit too. When Claire tries to heal her friend Mary from the hit, Mary refuses, takes blood from Claire, and goes to fight Juggernaut again. Again, she would have been killed, but Shadow, Me, and Kajino appears at the last moment and throws Juggernaut off the tower. He tells the two girls it's dangerous and everyone should hide. After the danger passes, Mary promises Claire to tell her everything, her true identity, mission, and relation to the Blood Queen. Mary 
reveals that over 1,000 years ago, it was the golden age of vampires, stronger than humans, easily killing them and taking their blood. But as time progressed, humans discovered vampires' weaknesses and learned to defend themselves. Then the situation developed further, and humans could kill many vampires, until Elizabeth, the blood queen of the city Mary is from, decided to stop this killing. Her decision was for vampires to stop drinking blood gradually, making them forget about blood truly. Elizabeth herself built a city where humans and vampires who could live in the sunlight normally would reside. But the story doesn't end there because Elizabeth couldn't stop her thirst for blood and always wanted to drink. For this reason, her skin would burn from the sun, and she couldn't transform to be closer to humans. On the day of the red moon, 1,000 years exactly, Elizabeth was thirstier for blood than any other day. Then Crimson, her servant, gave her just a drop of blood, but that drop was enough to reignite her thirst for blood, and Elizabeth spent the night killing humans and drinking their blood. The next day, realizing the disaster she caused, she took a dagger, killed herself with it, and asked her friend Mary to take care of the body. But that didn't happen because Crimson and his men took the body again and expelled Mary from the place, and since then, Mary wanted to retrieve the Blood Queen's body again. To comfort her, Claire tells her she is also cursed and probably will turn into a monster soon. That's why she does everything possible to help her brother before she turns into a monster. Thinking Kajina was trapped in the tower, unable to move, Claire agrees with Mary that she will help her retrieve Elizabeth's body from Crimson, and then they will help her brother. At that time, Kajina was in Elizabeth's vault, looking for anything useful. Nothing catches his attention except the money which he decides to take some of because he is broke. At the same time, Crimson decided to awaken Elizabeth, took her heart, and went to put it in a recently deceased body to revive her. But Shadow appears at the last moment, destroys the place on Crimson's head, and ruins his plan. And of course, since he didn't know about Elizabeth's story and why she wanted to awaken, he thought his mission was done and decided to steal some gold from the vault and leave the place. But what he didn't know was that when he exploded the tower, he didn't kill Elizabeth, who managed to wake up again, this time in a giant monster form. She attacks Claire, who is standing next to Mary looking for her brother, stabs Claire strongly, and drinks from her blood. Mary stands scared of what's happening and asks Elizabeth to leave her friend alone, but of course, Elizabeth doesn't care about her words. The girls from the Shadow Garden squad arrive to disrupt Elizabeth's attack and take Claire to heal her. But of course, the girl's power was much weaker than Elizabeth's, who was about to defeat them until Juggernaut, passing by, decides to hit Elizabeth too after seeing a big fight happening. But of course, he was much weaker than Elizabeth, who hits him, breaks his leg, and throws him to the ground. As for the rest of the girls still fighting her, she continues to drink from their blood, making her stronger and healing her wounds faster until she becomes stronger than before. Beta asks one of the girls to quickly take Claire from the place because, after all, she is their leader's big sister and they must help her. And they stand against Elizabeth's unstoppable attack. We move with Claire, who wakes up from the hit to find herself in a hospital with a doctor named Aurora in front of her. The doctor says she doesn't know whether to reassure her or worry her, but importantly, she's not cursed as she thought because someone important healed her long ago, of course. She meant Shadow, but Claire doesn't know that Shadow is her brother. Aurora tells her about the theory of evolution and how any animal in the forest had to evolved to adapt to wildlife. And now this is what's happening inside Claire's body since she was cursed long ago and now bitten by Elizabeth. Aurora tells her she has two types of blood trying to unite inside her and if she can control her body properly, she'll gain great strength. Aurora leaves her, but when Claire asks why she is helping her, Aurora says she's doing all this for Shadow's sake, and leaves with Claire lying on the bed, not understanding anything from the conversation. We return to Elizabeth, who nobody could stop until Shadow himself arrives, the first warrior able to duel her and stand against her. All the girls in the Shadow Garden realize Shadow is defending and protecting them, which they didn't know because they thought they were just servants for him. Shadow continues to fight, and all the gold he had falls and breaks from the battle's force until he decides he must destroy Elizabeth forever. Indeed, he flies with her into the sky, letting her know he must do this because she's like sick, and finally finishes her off. Thus, everyone turned into vampires returns to being normal humans, and even the moon returns to its natural color again. Afterward, Kajino stands eating in the middle of the street, and of course, nobody knew who he was. He keeps thinking, saying that all that happened is normal, it doesn't matter to him, but the bigger problem is his sister Claire's mixed blood, not knowing if it will help her or destroy her. He takes her, and they both board the train that will take them out of the lawless city after completing their mission there. But Kajino's worry for his sister doesn't stop. He keeps thinking about her and how all this 
has happened in that cursed place. When she asks him if he knows Shadow, he tells her no. All he remembers is that he burned down our school last year, nothing else about him. His sister Claire believes him and tells him that she now has superpower in her left hand and doesn't want him to worry or be afraid, so he reassures her that he will understand everything. And he says, okay, the most important thing is that we are both fine, none of us is hurt, and anything else that happened can be fixed, it's not important. The most important thing for him is the gold he managed to take with him, 500 coins, and he tells himself that if he needs any money in the future, he will return to this city and steal from the White Tower and the Black Tower since they are both still there. After everyone returns to their city, the Shadow Garden members are surprised to find someone at the train station wanting to steal commercial goods. When they ask him who he is, he tells them he is working for Garter, which is confusing because Garter is supposed to be a respectable man, not involved in wrongdoing, but they find the thug determined to steal the goods anyway, so they kill him and get rid of him instead of wasting time with pointless talk. But the Shadow Garden members knew that the matter wouldn't end there, and surely other organizations, upon hearing what happened, would send more people to take revenge, meaning the city was on the verge of entering a big war. When Kajino spends some time with his friends, he discovers they all bought new clothes and were happy with them because they were supposedly brand names. But the the shock was when they discovered all these clothes were fake and there was nothing genuine about them. Thinking about the matter, Kajino is sure that a big organization is behind all this, planning and producing counterfeit clothes and selling them in markets, taking a lot of money from people in return. Since Kajino likes to work in the shadows, he decides this will be his new mission since he now has nothing else to do. He goes to change his clothes, wears the shadow outfit, and rides the train to find out more about how far the problem has reached. There, he meets a woman who explains to him the extent of the situation. Now, now there are two major companies in the capital controlling the entire market, Garter's company and its rival, Mitsugoshi Company. Both are releasing products of dubious quality, whether genuine or not, but it's known they are making huge profits. To ensure no one fights them, they have appointed a guard named Geten, a strong knight no one can defeat, helping Garter and his organization. Kajino finally reaches the station where these markets are located, walks among them, observing what's happening, and sees an unnatural crowd around the products, whether here or there. The problem wasn't just the counterfeit goods Kajino faced, but he also found counterfeit money in the market. The one who put the counterfeit money relied on the city's fast trade movement, everyone paying money and receiving change, so Kajino decides to monitor the origin of this money and find out who is flooding the market with it. But in reality, Shadow's problem was always not having money and always needing to steal to survive. This time, he decides to change the plan a bit and participate in the counterfeiting himself under the name John Smith, so no one would recognize him. He rides the train with the girl who came up with the idea of counterfeiting the money, pressing her to make sure she won't ever speak until he is sure of her intentions, and then decides to engage in counterfeiting money for a while. Since Shadow will need people to work with him on his mission, he decides to recruit Delta, one of the girls from the Shadow Garden squad. Her problem is that she's a bit too bloodthirsty, and if she enters any fight against anyone, she must dismember them, which is precisely what happens while she's helping Shadow. But the news of the deaths of the followers of the commercial organizations gets known and spreads in the news until Gitan, who of course doesn't like this situation, decides to send a group of stronger knights than before to deal with whoever is doing this. At this time, we see Delta mercilessly killing people until one of them tells her, I am your brother, you don't have to kill me. When she gets closer, she indeed confirms he is her older brother, working with Gitan. Ten, but she kills him too, telling Shadow not to worry because she has more than 1,000 brothers and sisters, so he's not her only brother. Afterward, Delta keeps pestering Shadow to return with her to her crazy tribe and fight her father, and if he wins, he could become the tribe's leader. But of course, Shadow wasn't interested in this matter, because he is now in the middle of a dangerous mission, wanting to find out who is counterfeiting the money and then deal with them. That doesn't mean he can't benefit a bit until he eliminates them. Giddon learns what happened and that two people also killed his soldiers in a hideout where there was money and stole all the money. When Garter hears the news, he gets scared and tells Jaden they must stop all our projects until we find out who is after us and knows all our hideouts. But of course, Gaiden rejects this suggestion and tells him you are here to listen, and that's it. But otherwise, don't open your mouth. Of course, Gaiden thought the people doing this were from Mitsugoshi, so he decides to send more fighters to destroy them. Indeed, Gaiden sends his strongest warriors, this time to the company's headquarters itself, to quickly eliminate the competitors. Luna, knowing what happened and that Gitten's warriors have reached her, decides to deal with them herself. Indeed, when she goes out, she finds one of the Yodosuba, who are supposed to be the strongest fighters Gitten sent. But Luna was strong too, and the two kept fighting until Luna figured out her opponent's fighting style and told him so, surprising him. What surprised him more was when he realized she knew his fighting style and still didn't change hers, meaning her understanding of fighting techniques was limited and her own techniques were predictable. But all this was a trick, because Luna was well prepared for this battle, letting her opponent 
opponent think he could escape. Then she throws a sword at him as he tries to flee, killing him, and he falls to the ground dead. But the news the next day starts to wonder why every couple of days a body is found at Mitsugoshi, and what the secret behind this story is. Because it's supposed to be a commercial company's headquarters, and it doesn't make sense at all that every day the police find a body dumped there. When Garter reads this news, he becomes more scared and tells Jayton, they must stop our attacks now because what's happening means that Mitsugoshi is always ready for our attacks and not afraid of us. But of course, Jaiten wasn't joking about these things and insists that everything must be done as it is, and anyone who stands against them must be killed, whether from Mitsugoshi or any other company. Because these companies have always treated Gaten as a monster, he sees this as the best way to use the situation to prove who he really is. At this time, Kajino is training Luna with some additional exercises to make her stronger for when there's a new attack from Gitten's men. Over time, Luna manages to improve more and more, and she thanks Kajino for the effort he's making with her, but of course, Kajino just stands eating as if no one is talking to him. Luna wishes him to always stay happy and relaxed like this and leaves. After that, Shadow, who becomes John Smith when he gets involved in the money-making scheme, meets the girl again. This time, she had new news because she found a large place where they could manufacture and print the money, which of course was counterfeit. Then they would flood the markets with it, which would obviously create a big problem for Garter's organization, and they were supposed to go and look for who was behind this counterfeiting scheme and catch them. This was their plan because Gayten was the one who killed the girl's entire family, her father, mother, and siblings. After hearing the full story from her, John Smith tells her he thinks the counterfeit money is ready to hit the market because no one will notice it, and it's counterfeited in a professional way. Of course, both companies know what happened and see the counterfeit paper, and anyway, this was the plan. Mitsugoshi immediately suspects Garter and his men because they've used these methods many times before, but the entire company was scared of what was happening because the abundance of counterfeit money would make people afraid to buy. When Gaiden learns what happened, he is surprised because he knows that his organization's plan was to destroy commerce and spread counterfeit money in the markets. But this was supposed to happen with his knowledge because now the counterfeit money was injected into his company's banks, meaning his company was harmed just like anyone else. So of course, Jaden didn't understand anything and didn't know who was behind this money. This talk, since it leaked throughout the city, reaches the Shadow Garden, who decide to attack the train carrying the goods and the counterfeit money without knowing that all this was actually a plan from their leader and that he was John Smith. The girls storm the train but suspect something because there were no guards present, and before they can move from their spot, John Smith arrives. He throws them all from the train, and of course none of them can fight him because he is the one who trained them in the first place. When the girls fall outside the train, they decide they can't chase the train any longer because they are much slower than it. But one of them suspects something about John Smith's strength and says she doesn't think she has seen anyone with such strength before except for one person. But still, she can't put everything together and doesn't know who he is. When Mitsugoshi's employees find out that the counterfeit money is always on a train without any guards, protected only by one person, John Smith, they decide to send their strongest fighter, Delta, to stand against him. Delta attacks the train, trying to take down John Smith. But of course, without any success, because he overpowers her like the rest and ties her up. But Delta, being smart, figures out that he must be Shadow and asks him what his connection is to the counterfeit money and why he is on this train. Shadow can't hide it from her anymore and tells her he is now working on a secret mission, so she must keep his secret. He also tells her that in exchange for her silence, he'll give her a new mission. But Kajina wasn't prepared with any mission for her, just saying so, and then he keeps thinking about what mission to give her. Finally, he tells her he wants her to hunt down Juggernaut, the ruler of the Black Tower, although it's considered considered an impossible mission, but he had nothing else to offer to get rid of her. Luna learns that the train passed without Delta being able to stop it, which means only one thing, Delta died, so she asks her friends to look for her until they find even the body. At this time, the counterfeit money had spread throughout the city, bankrupting all companies. All that's left is for people to also find out about the counterfeit money in the market, and then all buying and selling activities will stop without warning. While Luna doesn't know how to deal with this disaster, Garter and Jaten also realize the extent of the catastrophe. The sex sends two people to inform them that they are not in control, and all this is happening while he's there, unable to do anything. But Gaten, not liking the way the sex people speak, kills them both and tells Garter that if he wants to stay alive too, he must set up checkpoints in the capital, even if it annoys the royal family itself. The most important thing is to catch this person named John Smith as quickly as possible. Initially, Garter is afraid to execute the orders, but when he sees what happened to the two from the sect, 
He agrees immediately. One of the Shadow Garden members goes to meet Shadow and tells him she has some important news to tell them. The first thing is that a lot of counterfeit money has been injected into the country, and likely this news has now reached the royal palace and they will take action against what happened. The second news is that Delta disappeared after going to fight John Smith, which likely means she died. But when Shadow finds out the matter has escalated and is turning into drama, he tells her no. Delta is alive. She's just on a distant mission, but still alive. In the end, the girl asks him to fight John Smith since he's the strongest one there and surely can handle him. Of course, she didn't know they were both the same person. But Shadow, to avoid the unfolding situation, tells her he's currently busy with many things and can't fight John Smith. When she asks what he's busy with, he shows her a paper with a code written from five different languages and tells her he's developing this code. If she can decode it, he'll teach her too. Later, Luna also suspects him and goes to him on the train to fight, realizing he's Shadow, not someone else. She asks about Delta, and he tells her he sent her on a distant mission but didn't kill her. A big fight happens between them because Luna needs to know why he's distributing counterfeit money everywhere. But John Smith didn't have time to explain and tells her everything will become clear to her eventually, throwing her off the train to the ground because more than that would delay him. After the mission is completed and the fake papers fill the city, there was only one thing left. That is for John Smith to find out why the girl behind the counterfeiting idea hates Gaten so much. She explains she used to be from a small village and tribe with nothing in their hands. All they decided to do was to ally with another small tribe to become stronger together. To do this, she marries the son of the other tribe's prince, who was Gaten. At that time, Gaten was good, and they lived well together initially, until Jaten joined the sect and started fulfilling their requests. Even during a nearby war that destroyed their city, Jaten was helping the sect. He decided to kill anyone who refused the the sex teachings. Even when he found her not wanting to join, he beat her until he thought she was dead and left her. That's why she now wants to flood the market with fake money until Garter's company and Gitten go bankrupt taking everything from him. We see a large group of citizens standing in front of the bank, their faces showing worry and fear. We learn the bank is close to bankruptcy due to the large amount of counterfeit money printed and circulated by the people directly. The bank, after learning about the counterfeit money, announces it can't dispense balances, which is why we see people extremely surprised that all bank branches have closed. At the same time, we see Guyton sitting with the person responsible for all this financial corruption, asking if all this time, they didn't know who was responsible for the counterfeit money in the market. The official says they couldn't precisely identify who's behind all this but suspects Yukimi, the ruler of the White Tower, because all clues point to her being most capable of doing this, especially since they saw a vehicle from her company moving this morning, filled with counterfeit golden coins. Shadow listens to all these details, focusing and feeling his suspicions were correct. Then we see the Shadow Garden girls sitting scared because of Shadow's sudden disappearance, especially since he didn't tell them anything about his disappearance, making them very worried about the financial problems that suddenly hit the city. They discuss the financial troubles and agree that the city will economically collapse very soon, especially since all shops have closed and even people with money. After the currency collapse, find their money worthless. They try to come up with a suggestion to solve the problem and say maybe they can show people some golden coins, even if not real, to reassure them and make them feel the banks have balances because, with this situation, all banks will go bankrupt. But suddenly, they feel that no one can fix the economic situation this way and make the currency collapse except Shadow, saying he must be doing this intentionally to execute something in his mind especially since he recently cut ties with us. It's impossible he's doing all this unintentionally, especially since he gave us several chances, but we proved we're not as efficient as he wanted, which is why he distanced himself from us. But as soon as they reach this conclusion, they collapse and start crying because they really love Shadow and want to continue fighting evil with him. Suddenly, while they're sitting sad, one of them enters and tells them, by the way, as we suspected, the man named Gaten is leading the operation for the Diablos sect, and he was the one who planned from the beginning to distribute counterfeit money and make Mitsugoshi Company go bankrupt. Then they all realize Shadow's intelligence and bravery, and that he sacrificed himself to save Mitsugoshi Company and defeat Gaten's plan. Understanding that Shadow intentionally made the banks close because the counterfeit money was going to be distributed through these banks, flooding the entire city, and it would have been impossible to control the situation then. One of the Shadow Garden girls manages to decode the message Shadow sent, and through this message, they know he is still willing to work with them, and also had to change his name and suddenly distance himself from them because suspicions were circling around them. He was able to use this period to carry out his brilliant plan, and also save Mitsugoshi Company because he managed to store a large amount of gold that covered all the counterfeit money he printed. Thus, the Diablos sect was the only party that lost. Suddenly, they remember that Delta, their colleague, 
has been missing for a while, and at the same moment, they are surprised by her entering. We then conclude that Delta was the one who helped Shadow in printing the counterfeit money. At the same time, we see Shadow looking for Gitten after finding out he was behind all the problems from the beginning. Then we see Yukimi talking with Gitten, telling him that even though he saved her and her city in the past, there is a great evil inside him that must be controlled. Yukimi tries to leave the place, but her words provoke Gaten, so he attacks her, saying he should have killed her the day he saved the city. But at that moment, Shadow arrives at the place and attacks Gaten. Gaten is surprised by Shadow's attack, but Shadow tells him he came here to retrieve something precious to him, implying he's talking about Yukimi. Shadow keeps hitting Gaten violently, telling him to speak, but Gaten refuses to talk until Shadow continues hitting him until Jaiten decides to finally talk. Gaten speaks with Shadow, telling him that he once wanted to protect the city and also wanted to protect his lover, revealing he's talking about Yukimi. We notice that Gaiten is about to die, so he entrusts Shadow to take care of Yukimi, and indeed, Shadow promises her safety. The police arrest the bank manager because he was tampering with customer balances, making them believe he had a large reserve, but the recent crisis exposed him, and everyone found out the bank had no reserve at all. Then we see Yukimi talking with two of her guards, telling them about her adventures with Shadow. After that, Alpha, who introduces herself to Yukimi, tells her she's from the Shadow Garden Girls and gives her a letter to read. We learn the letter was from Gitten before he died, and Yukimi understands from the letter that Diablo's sect was what doomed Gaten. Alpha talks with Yukimi after she reads the letter, telling her their main mission is to fight the Diablo's sect because they spread evil in our city, and by the way, Mitsugoshi Company is just a front for the Shadow Garden organization that Shadow leads. Yukimi is surprised when she hears this but decides to join the Shadow Garden and fight evil with them. Then we go to see Shadow digging in the ice to reach the place where he buried the legitimate money and the golden coins. We see a meeting of the Seven Shadows group discussing after they found out Kajino gave a bunch of his tickets to his friends, and we learn these tickets were an invitation to relax at Mitsugoshi's hot springs. The group's leaders say Kajino doesn't do things by chance and must have a purpose for distributing these tickets. Then we see the Shadow Garden girls talking among themselves, saying surely the tickets have a code Shadow wants us to decipher. Indeed, when they examine each ticket, they notice the phrase, Dragon's Tears written. Alpha shows them a video with much talk about Dragon's Tears, and they see Shadow asking them in an earlier time to dig to reach the place the Dragon's Tears legend talks about. They feel the matter is important, so they keep asking themselves if Dragon's Tears have something to do with the sect, but reassure themselves they've ended all the sect's evil activities. Then they say, since Shadow decided to give us these tickets, he must suspect some suspicious activity by the sect or someone trying to do evil. But the problem is there are six of them and only three tickets, meaning only three can go. They argue about who should go but finally decide to play rock, paper, scissors to determine who will attend the meeting. At the meeting, they introduce themselves to two men as Delton, Nasomi, and Zetan, but notice the men there are frivolous, only wanting to flirt with the girls. But Delton tells them we are with Mr. Kajino, and then the men get very scared. Afterward, Nasomi excuses them and lets them know they'll enter the party and surely meet again. Then, the men try to attract the girls' attention with a book on love advice. Shortly after, the girls decide to go play volleyball, but that's not the truth. They want to observe everything in the place to find out the real reason Shadow sent them to this party. So the first step is to get rid of the men sticking to them everywhere. They manage to magnetically put them to sleep, and the men don't remember anything except seeing the girls at the party a while ago. At this time, the Shadow Garden girls are observing everything at the party, hoping to find any clue that leads them to why the party is important to Shadow. Then two of them sit in the sauna trying to connect all the events at the party to Dragon's Tears. Delton begins to tell them, saying she learned some information about the Dragon's Tears legend and will now tell them the whole story. She tells them there was once a princess who loved a dragon very much and raised it from its infancy. But unfortunately, after the dragon grew a bit, war started and the dragon protected the princess with great bravery despite many injuries. But the problem was after returning from the war, he was surprised to find the princess ill and close to death. When he went to see her and confirmed she was about to die, he asked her not to give up on fatigue and to come on his back so they could fly a bit. Then the princess shed a tear and the dragon couldn't control himself and also cried and because of the dragon's tears, the whole kingdom was filled with water, but it wasn't ordinary water. The princess knew this water was filled with the secret of life. But strangely after that, the princess recovered and kept calling for the dragon. But unfortunately, she couldn't find him anywhere. After Delton finished her story, she said surely Shadow sent us here because of something related to this story. We see the men spying on the Shadow Garden girls, but they discover the men spying on them through their magical ability. So they spray them with salt 
water and discover then that the water from the spring reacts with tears. Although the talk was strange at first, when they experimented with one of them and a tear fell from her eye into the spring water, a great magical energy occurred in the place. Then they conclude this is what Shadow wanted them to learn through this party. So they say they must end the legendary curse of the dragon in this place, change their clothes quickly, and warn each other to be careful so no one discovers they are from the Shadow Garden. They start their attack on the place, saying they will now end the dragon's tears legend forever. But they are surprised after doing so by golden water droplets falling on the place, concluding this water has healing properties for many diseases and is also beneficial for skin and hair. Then they conclude Shadow didn't want to end the dragon's tears legend but wanted to save the dragon's spirit, especially since it was a loyal dragon to the princess. The girls decide to benefit from this adventure, so they collect a large amount of the golden water that fell in the hot spring and make many products from it, starting to sell them. They are then happy that Shadow decided not to let their holiday be wasted, so he made them enter a not dangerous adventure and, at the same time, they were able to benefit from the product they made from the dragon's tears. We see Rose, who had a nightmare in which she saw herself killing her father, but she wakes up to tell us that the city of the castle was once a beautiful and peaceful place. Unfortunately, a war started and destroyed everything beautiful in the city. She thought she could end the war by joining the Shadow Garden, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. Then, one of the Shadow Garden girls knocks on her door and asks her to get ready quickly for a new mission. We learn that in this mission, they won't call each other by names but by numbers. They arrive at an old castle and want to find out why the Diablo's sect is interested in this castle, even though it seems unimportant. The girls talk with Rose, telling her they chose her because Shadow said she was qualified to join their missions, making Rose very happy. Each one of them remembers when Shadow gave her her supernatural power, but they decide to focus on their mission and complete it. They observe the road to find out why the sect is interested in this place, and are surprised to see Quadwo, one of the sect's leaders. They confirm that the sect played a significant role in the city's destruction. Quadwo's assistant tells him everything is ready. Quadwo is pleased, approaches a stone on the ground and places a card in it. The stone lights up, and then Quadwo asks his assistants to bring someone of royal blood. When Rose sees this scene, especially seeing her mother walking in front of Quadwo and going to place her fingerprint on the stone, she is shocked especially when the whole place is filled with magical energy. At that moment, Rose asks the Shadow Garden girls to prepare to fight, but the girls are surprised, especially since Quadwo has many guards, and the fight now is surely not even. But Rose insists on her opinion, telling them that the magical ring Quadwo has is the key and the solution to all problems. Before the girls can comprehend, Rose emerges from where they were hiding, forcing the girls into the situation to fight Quadwo and the rest of the sex men. Quadwo is surprised by the girls' attack and asks who they are, but Rose attacks them, constantly asking why her mother is involved in this matter. At the same time, Rose's mother is scared and asks her to help. Quadwo doesn't care about everything that happened and tells them they must be Shadow Garden girls. Thanks for coming here, and even more thanks for being able to find Princess Rose, since we have been looking for her without success. Then the Shadow Garden girls discuss what happened at the castle, saying there must be a secret behind Rose since Quadwo talked about her as a princess, showing she is very important to the sect. They agree they must prepare quickly and go there again to save the entire kingdom and eliminate the sect's threat to the kingdom of Oriana. They also agree to let the sect take Rose as a trap for them, so the Shadow Garden girls can eliminate them afterward. We see Kajino having breakfast and reading in the journal about the recent political upheavals in the kingdom of Oriana and the power struggle between the two largest parties in the kingdom. He reads journalists' comments about Rose, considered the best candidate for the throne. Kajino decides to help Rose reach the throne of the kingdom, but at that moment, representatives from the army arrive, and we notice they want to loot the place where Kajino was having breakfast. The girl working at the place tells them she has already given them everything she has, but the soldiers keep harassing her. Kajino tries to defend her, but those men beat him, and then we see the girl apologizing to him for what happened and thanking him for trying to save her. Kajino tells her there's no need for thanks, but he has to leave now because he has important things to do. We see Shadow on his way, thinking about how to make Rose reach the throne, especially since he tried many times according to the kingdom's legends, which say that the queen who will reign must overcome her feelings, especially feelings of mercy. Therefore, Shadow plans to bring Rose to the throne, and then have the Shadow Garden group help her, and everything in the kingdom will be against the sex evil. But when Shadow thinks about everything that happened, he feels his plan has failed, and that he can't do what he wants. Shadow notices a house where soldiers gather with all the things they have stolen throughout the day. He decides to storm the house, beats them, and 
and manages to take all the things they have. Then he takes some of the money and returns it to the girl the soldiers had beaten and taken her money from, leaving the money in front of the door and disappearing. The girl, when she goes out and finds the money, is very happy and confirms that Shadow had been watching her all the time. We then see Quadwo very annoyed by the existence of the Shadow Garden and keeps talking, saying he is sure he will defeat them and manage to reach the throne with the sect and the whole kingdom will be under their command. But at that moment, Rose appears and tells him she is confident she will defeat him. Quadwa mocks her words, saying even if her supernatural power is present now, it surely won't last. Then Quadwa attacks Rose and manages to injure her, but then Shadow appears, and Rose is very happy. Shadow attacks Quadwo, manages to defeat him, and also returns Rose's power, making her injured hand heal. Shadow then meets with the Shadow Garden girls, telling them their mission isn't over yet. They must continue their journey to eliminate all the sex evil. But the Shadow Garden girls are upset with Rose, considering her a traitor because she revealed their location from the beginning when she wanted to save her mother. Shadow tries to calm the girls down but is surprised by a message saying Princess Rose will marry the counselor, Du Aim, who is one of the sect's biggest leaders. At that moment, Shadow loses his temper and declares he will personally avenge Rose for her betrayal. We see a meeting among the girls of Shadow Garden discussing how to punish Rose for her betrayal. Some of them initially reject describing what happened as betrayal, but eventually decide that Rose is indeed a traitor, especially since she wasted Shadow's efforts and those of all the girls of Shadow Garden. That's why she must be punished. Meanwhile, we see Jacino attempting to approach the royal palace to reach Rose and punish her. However, he is surprised by the large number of guards present and doesn't know how to proceed. Suddenly, Epsilon appears, amazed because she hasn't seen him for a long time. Shadow is delighted because Epsilon has permission to enter the palace without being stopped by the guards, due to her being an artist with many paintings in the royal palace. Shadow thanks her for allowing him to enter the palace, but she tells him that it's just a small part of repaying him for teaching her music. Suddenly, as they walk in the palace, Du Yim, whom Rose is supposed to marry, appears. He talks to Epsilon and invites her to the feast held for the wedding celebration. Du Yim mentions Rose's illness, suggesting she may not be able to attend the feast. This upsets Shadow because he had planned to speak with Rose during the meal. Du Yim then directs his conversation to Epsilon, glancing at Shadow and asking who she's with. Epsilon replies that he's her student in drawing but doesn't deny that he's her teacher in music. Then Du Yim tells her he shouldn't have entered the palace because he doesn't have permission. Epsilon feels embarrassed and says it's okay for them to walk now, but Du Yim insists they need permission later and asks Shadow to play a piece for the guests. Shadow starts playing, impressing everyone, and he also manages to use his magical ability to steal all the rings from the guests. He thinks to himself that these are the rings stolen from the people of the kingdom, but more importantly, he managed to reach the magical ring for the new queen's wedding and coronation without anyone noticing. Later, we see Shadow trying to flirt with Chan, Princess Rose's servant. They walk together in the palace garden, and Chan tells him how much she admires his music, but Shadow isn't interested in her compliments and asks Chan about Princess Rose's whereabouts. Chan changes the subject, saying she thought he was walking with her because he liked her, not knowing he was interested in the princess. She continues, saying she doesn't like Princess Rose because she's strange, unlike other princesses, as she has always loved peculiar things like fighting and fencing. Chan tries to tarnish Princess Rose's image as much as she can in front of Shadow and asks him if he still wants to know where the princess is. Shadow confirms he needs to know Princess Rose's location urgently, and then Chan loses hope that Shadow likes her, telling him the princess is in the Western Tower. But as soon as Shadow moves to reach the princess, he is surprised by a huge man who claims to be the castle guard. He warns Shadow, as we know he's very fond of Chan. The guard insists they're tired and risking their lives while he's comfortable in his home practicing music, just to come here and steal his beloved from him. Shadow clarifies he was just asking her some questions, and then he reaches the tower where Rose is located. He manages to climb easily and enter to talk to her, asking if her marriage plans are still valid. Rose is deeply affected but surprises him by confirming that indeed, the plans are still valid. This infuriates Shadow, accusing her of betraying Shadow Garden. He didn't want to ask her why she stabbed her fiancé and killed her father in the past, but now he sees she will ruin the kingdom and all of Shadow Garden's hard work. Rose talks to Shadow, begging him to forget her and not to think about anything she does. Despite Shadow offering her a chance to help, Rose insists on her decision and asks him to leave and not think about her again. After this, we see Du Yim go into Rose's room, asking why she's been absent all day. He approaches her and notices she's been crying and realizes she may have guests. Rose reassures him, but when Du Yim gets closer, Rose tells him to stay away. Du Yim loses his temper, grabs her by the neck, and tells her they're close to being married. 
so she must respect him more. But Rose reminds him it's just a marriage on paper, which makes Ju Yim choke her even harder. This scares Rose, and she promises to treat him better. We notice that Shadow is monitoring everything, thinking they must resort to the alternative plan. He puts his hand in his pocket to make sure he still has the magical wedding ring he stole from the hall. Later, we see the girls of Shadow Garden discussing what happened to Rose, admitting it was a big mistake for her mother to show up at the same time they were watching. However, they conclude it's not their mistake, but a mistake of the Seven Shades. They seem worried and unsure of what Shadow will do about Rose's situation, fearing that if her marriage fails, the entire kingdom will be in danger due to conflicts between Shadow Garden and the Diablo organization. Later on, we see Du Yim talking to the sect leader, assuring him that everything is going according to plan. The sect leader emphasizes the importance of the magical energy contained in the Black Rose. To activate this energy, the magical wedding ring must be with him at all times. Du Yim reassures him that the ring never leaves his pocket. Once the meeting is over, we see Du Yim holding the box containing the magical ring, saying, the princess and the kingdom are with me, and I'm confident I've won. Now we wait for Shadow Garden to take action. Shadow understands that Rose refused to speak with him and told him the reason for her marriage to Duwain. This is because he took her mother hostage and planned to kill her if Rose disobeyed his orders. Shadow then realizes that the situation won't end until he personally frees Rose's mother. Suddenly, Chan appears and informs him about the man who was bothering him, the castle guard, and assures him that the guard won't trouble him anymore. Chan had accused the guard of stealing food to protect Shadow. We understand that Chan is very fond of Shadow, but she didn't have time to express her feelings. Absylon appears and seems very jealous of Shadow. While Absylon argues with Chan, Shadow decides to calm himself by playing music and lets them argue. Shadow moves to resolve Rose's problem before a disaster occurs. As he walks in the castle, he unexpectedly meets Dewayne, talking to his true love. Dewayne tells her that he loves her, and their marriage with Rose is necessary to seize control of the kingdom. At the same time, we see Rose sitting, feeling depressed and fearful. She wonders how she can save her mother. Suddenly, she finds Shadow in her room and expects him to kill her for betraying the Shadow Garden. But Shadow reassures her and asks her to come with him to show her the truth. As they walk around the castle, Shadow stops at a room and lets Rose overhear Duwaim talking to his sleeping true love, who turns out to be Rose's mother. Initially, Rose refuses to believe what she sees and hears, but Shadow tells her there's no time for disbelief. He urges her to witness everything for herself and decide what she wants to do. Rose was walking from the place, and we saw her later talking with Shadow. She told him that although her life was ruined, she killed her father, her mother betrayed her, and she betrayed her closest friends. But he stayed with her all the way no matter what happened. Shadow finished the piece he was playing and got up from the place, surprising Rose by leaving her a wedding ring on the chair. On the wedding day, we see everyone ready for the party, and we see Du Aim listening to himself, the plan that the sect leader told him when he informed him that he must marry Rose to mix her royal blood with his, and then he can make the sect triumph over the Shadow Garden and rule the entire kingdom. But as soon as he he opens the ring box, he is surprised that the ring is not there. Then the sect leader appears and talks to him, telling him that in a few hours he will become the greatest leader of the kingdom. Du Aim is afraid to inform the sect leader that the ring is lost and keeps convincing himself that he will solve the problem. The wedding ceremony starts after that, and we see the person in charge of the ceremonies asking Du Aim if he accepts Rose as his wife. He says yes, but the problem is when he asks Rose if she accepts Du Aim as her husband, she says she refuses to marry him. Of course, Rose's response shocks everyone present, and Du Aim himself talks to her and tells her that this is not the time for nonsense, but Rose's expressions and tone are serious, and she says that she is speaking seriously. Then Rose starts talking, confessing everything. She tells Du Aim in front of everyone that he's guilty and doesn't love this kingdom. She reveals his plans to seize power and overthrow the government. Du Aim is speechless and tries to defend himself, but Rose accuses him of poisoning her father and holding her mother hostage. She even accuses him of wearing her engagement ring to shock everyone with a live video. In the video, Greg, Rose's father, and the former ruler, Oriana, speaks to the people, claiming he's been poisoned. He reveals that he knows who did it, blaming Duane for following the organization's plan. Greg then announces that he hands over the rule to his daughter, Rose, asking the people to support her. The people revolt after watching the video and decide to overthrow Duane, but Rose surprises everyone by pulling out her sword and sentencing Duane to death for his crimes. However, just as she's about to strike, her mother's neck is suddenly cut by a flying sword. A knight named Mordred appears, 
revealing himself as the leader of the faction. Unfortunately, he possesses magical power controlling Rose's ring. He summons the Demon King and orders him to kill all who support her. The Demon King Ragnarok arrives to slaughter all who support Rose, while the Shadow Garden Girls hold an emergency meeting to discuss their plan after learning that the Demon King has reached their kingdom. Back at the Royal Palace, Ragnarok unleashes many monsters to invade the kingdom. Suddenly, Shadow appears, surprising Mordred, who asks him who he is. Shadow introduces himself as the leader of the Shadow Garden organization and explains that he and his assistants are there to eradicate evil. Rose is surprised by what's happening, but Shadow tells her to quickly leave the area. The Shadow Garden girls provoke Mordred, telling him they can defeat him easily. Mordred draws his sword and attacks, but the Shadow Garden girls realize he's using a different strategy in his attacks. Despite this, they manage to defend against his strikes, leaving Mordred astonished. Mordred tries to attack the Shadow Garden girls again, but they fend off his assault and counterattack. Meanwhile, Rose tries to leave the palace, seemingly to escape, but when she meets her servant, she asks her to open the secret cellar in the palace garden, intending to lead soldiers to save the citizens from their unknown fate. Outside the palace, the rest of the Shadow Garden girls defend the citizens against the Demon King's monsters. At the same time, Shadow fights Ragnarok and quickly identifies Ragnarok's defense strategy, taunting him that he will defeat him easily. Rose speaks to the military leaders, urging them to act quickly to save their people. Then she starts thinking about what to do with Mordred, but suddenly Beta and then Sama and Absylon appear, having defeated Mordred easily, surprising Rose because she didn't believe they had that much power. Mordred, annoyed, speaks with the Shadow Garden girls, telling them he's not yet defeated and is confident in Ragnarok's victory. However, the girls lie to him, saying that since Ragnarok is fighting Shadow, his defeat is assured. This statement doesn't please Mordred, who tells them they'll see he was right when the Demon King arrives, as he is the most dangerous creature on the planet and can defeat anyone, regardless of their strength. The Shadow Garden girls ask him to tell them everything from the beginning, so Mordred begins explaining that in addition to our world, there are many other worlds in existence. He continues saying they were interested in studying these different worlds for years in the organization. Then Absylon asks if he means worlds in space, to which Mordred replies no, he means the hidden dimensions of the worlds existing on Earth. He explains about realms like the Realm of the Dead, which consists of graveyards, and the Realm of Fire, which is just fire. He adds that they discovered magic on Earth only about 10 million years ago, when our world collided with another. Since then, they haven't been sure if humans were originally from the other world and came here after the collision or if they were already living on this Earth, and the other creatures came to us. He gives examples of things disappearing suddenly without a trace, like Atlantis, which moved to another world and disappeared there. They then discuss the Devil Diabolos, the foundation of the organization. Mordred tells them that Diabolos is a demon who came from another world, because they couldn't find any basis for him in their world. Mordred continues, saying that Oriana's kingdom collided with another world, opening a magical gate that allowed all magical beings to enter Oriana. The king refused to close the gate, leading to the requirement for someone from the royal bloodline to activate the ring to close it permanently. But this never happened due to power struggles within the kingdom, leading to their current situation. Everyone is surprised when Ragnarok's hand appears, believing Shadow was defeated in the battle. But in a moment, Shadow strikes Ragnarok, surprising Mordred, as Ragnarok's defeat seemed impossible. The Shadow Garden girls regroup and learn that the group outside the palace has managed to get rid of all the monsters attacking the citizens. They decide to split up to end the battle quickly. Afterwards, Mordred merges with Ragnarok and begins fighting Shadow. Someone who skillfully escapes all attacks and then disappears, so the Demon King keeps looking for him. Shadow suddenly appears and tells him that humans discovered lightning long ago, and were amazed by it because it's a power from the sky. As science advanced, humans were able to create something as fast and powerful as lightning, which is the atomic bomb. Shadow manages to gather all the lightning power on the planet and strikes the Demon King with it. We notice that the sky lit up as if it were noon, although the entire battle was at night. The girls of the Shadow Garden are very worried because of the strong light that appeared after Shadow's strike on the Demon King. But after a while, the light goes out, and they see Shadow after he managed to banish the Demon King out of the entire galaxy. Despite Shadow's victory, he always stays close to those in need, and appears immediately to help everyone whenever something happens anywhere. 